Welcome to the online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today we are talking about vision issues in Parkinson's disease with neuro optometrist. How do you say that? Optometrist. Optometrist. I was so ready to say that perfectly. Dr. June Chang. I am Joe Moeller, PCLA board member. For those of you who don't know us, we are a Los Angeles based nonprofit serving the Parkinson's community. At the beginning of the pandemic, we developed a series of online education events in order to continue serving our community. Today's program is part of our Let's Talk Parkinson series, which is brought to you by our sponsors, Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, a grant from Linda and Stuart Resnick, and US World Meds. Doctor, if you could please introduce yourself and as you are sharing a moment ago, it help explain the difference to those of us who don't understand what it is you do specifically and how it affects our community. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to meet you and speak with you. I've already had someone reach out to me, Marsha, uh, in terms of her interest. Uh, so I'm so excited that you are also interested in this subject and topic. Um, I'm in uh, an office here in West Los Angeles. I'll just show you real quick where I am. This is the vision therapy room. We have two large vision therapy rooms continuing to increase the technology in here, even during uh, the COVID times. So we really are trying to stay on top of things. Dr. Sean Joseph is here with us today. So he'll be listening on and hopefully he can help us answer some of the more technical questions that are starting to come in as we speak. Ah, there he is. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph for joining us. And uh, so Dr. Joseph is uh, um, going to be the new owner of the practice soon. And he is mainly uh, center based in our main office in Encino. This is a satellite practice. So what you see here is just a small sampling of what this practice can offer to patients in terms of vision and vision rehab. Okay, so uh, I wanted to start off explaining the differences or exactly what I do as a neurooptometrist comparatively to some other um, healthcare professionals, neurooptometrists, and uh, primary care optometrists, because there is quite a lot of confusion as to what um, I do that is very different. And so I don't really want to get into the science part of it, but I'll just kind of tell you how I approach my patients and each case and how that's kind of different from a neuro ophthalmologist or other optometrist. So um, we started off years ago um, with Padula. Okay, Dr. Padula is kind of our founding father. And he created a, a field of neuro optometry. Okay, I don't know if you can see it. And so neurooptometry is kind of a branch out of behavioral optometry. So behavioral optometry, it's a little glary. Behavioral optometry was based on the idea that vision is learned. Okay, so vision is learned and it's not just about 2020. So when I see a patient, um, getting someone to see 2020 is probably number 10, 15 on the list of my priorities. What I really am interested in is to see how well you perceive space, how well you can interpret what you see and make it meaningful to you in your life. So it's a very kind of almost existential question I'm trying to figure out. What are you seeing? What does it mean to you? And how does it enable you or prevent you from doing what you want to do in life, such as reading, moving, walking, and interacting with others? So that's what I'm mainly interested in. So a lot of the patients that I see, I work um, on a very customized basis. I don't really have uh, cookie cutter exams. And I kind of start from a point where I feel like it is the patient's main interest. 
So I may not test visual acuity until halfway through the exam, just because I'm looking at other things like how well the eyes move. How well are your eyes able to follow a target from one direction to the other and in all quadrants? The other issue I'm very concerned about is peripheral vision, peripheral awareness. A lot of times when a person is suffering from a neurological condition, it is very difficult to be aware of the peripheral vision and coordinate it um, appropriately with what you're looking at directly straight ahead. What happens a lot of times in neuro injuries is it becomes very, very difficult to be aware of the surroundings and a phenomenon happens where all of the focus and attention happens centrally in the central vision. So even though there's not a visual field loss or cut, the attention tends to get focused centrally. And that really can interrupt the processing of vision in the brain. I am really focused on how you process your vision in the brain, utilizing lenses such as prisms and using filters to help that processing in the brain, okay? Uh, the other things that I'm consider, uh, concerned about are some perceptual things like how well you remember what you see, how well you're able to quickly look at a target and understand what it is but maybe not know all the details. So for instance, you might be going for a walk and you see someone far away in the distance and you know who it is, but you don't see all the details. Like you don't know, you know exactly what their face looks like. You don't know exactly who that is from seeing them with 20-20 vision, but you know who it is because from your memory, in your brain, you've seen them before. And so the form of that person, the posture of that person, the colors they wear, the clothes that they wear, the way they move, sends a message to your brain saying, oh, that's Dave from across the street. So that's kind of what I'm interested in is how well you can identify things in your environment and process them and then do the appropriate thing. Like say, hi, Dave, right? These are all very important things because they allow us to interact in our community and they also help us to stay safe. When there's an interruption, it prevents us from interacting and it interferes with our ability to stay safe. So that's why I am working with the patients in the neurological brain uh, department. And I want to speak about um, some things that start to change that I've noticed in Parkinson's patients over time. One of the things that I've noticed that are kind of from a medical point of view is Parkinson's patients tend to develop dry eye symptoms. Part of that is due to a decreased blink rate. So one of the things that I would recommend is actually practice and doing conscious blinking to help with re-wetting the eyes, to help prevent the eyes from drying out in the first place. You can put a little post-it somewhere next to your workstation and have the little word blink and that can cue you to blinking. You can also practice blinking throughout your day and just you know, kind of squeeze your eyes really tight for about five seconds and then boom, open them up. This accomplishes many things. Not only are you re-wetting the eyes so that your cornea doesn't dry out and get irritated, but are also working the eye muscles that control the eyelids. Okay, so it's really good for your facial muscles too. So you can practice some deep blinking throughout the day, consciously squeeze, close the eyes tight, 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 and then release to open. 
It also will impact your focusing system to allow you to have a bigger and broader, more distant focus, okay? That's one of the first things I recommend my therapists do with patients who have uh, similar syndromes, Parkinson's. The other thing that to think about, I thought I was gonna have a little better view of the chalkboard, but the lighting is a little bit off. I wonder if I turn off the light, let me see if this helps. Okay, can you see the board? No. All right, so let me talk a little bit about um, the other options for dryness. So I re um, would recommend you write this down for dryness, H2O. All right, there are two H's and an O. The first H is heat. You can apply warm compress to your eyelids to help stimulate the glands to be, produce better oils and tears so that your tear film is more stable. Okay, so that's the first one, heat. The second one is hygiene. And so hygiene involves using maybe a gentle lid wipe to wipe your eyes at the in the morning and in the evening to help keep your eyes clean. There are a lot of bacteria loves to grow on the eyelids because it's a very warm and moist environment. That bacteria gets into the glands and causes irritation and plugging up of the glands so they stop producing good oils. So if you can keep your eyelids clean over time, it helps to prevent that and reverse it. Ocusoft makes really good lid hygiene products that you can look through and decide which one works best for you. The last one is O, H2O, omega-3s. Make sure you're getting enough omega-3s in your diet. You can talk to your doctor about what's the best way to do it. If you're taking blood thinners, you wanna be careful about the omega-3s. One of the best ways to get omega-3s I have found for myself is just eating a couple little handfuls of walnuts during the day. Again, you can get fish, but you want to make sure it's a high quality fish so that it is not tainted with heavy metals, okay, which can be neurotoxic, which you really want to avoid. Again, make sure you get really high quality omega-3s in your diet. So those are some three basic things you can do for dry eyes, the deep blinks and the H2O. The other thing that I start to notice in Parkinson's patients is the eye movements start to become less efficient. So there are a lot of eye exercises that you can do and do it consistently to help keep the neurological pathways going to the deep centers of your brain where the feedback loops occur to give you good eye movements. So that's a mouthful. But there are a myriad of feedback loops that go on in your brain that are related to how you control your eyes. And Dr. Joseph and I both know those charts that we're supposed to memorize on these feedback loops that just make us dizzy. It is very complicated. But the more, the good thing to know about this, the more you stimulate these feedback loops, the more those neurons stay connected, okay? In particular for Parkinson's patients, we're concerned with your basal ganglia because that's where dopamine lives, all right? So that's why the eye movements are important for your Parkinson's overall is because that particular place is affected for you and the eye movement feedback loops go directly to the basal ganglia, all right? That's why vision is so important. It's a basic neuro neurophysiology 101 understanding. So we can do a little eye movement exercises. We'll get to that. The last thing that we see with Parkinson's patients is convergence insufficiency, okay? This term now is really starting to get more to be um, a common term in the medical field and in the, in the households. Convergence insufficiency occurs when the two eyes have difficulty drawing in and pulling together inwards. This is convergence of the eyes, that's divergence. Parkinson's, we generally tend to see a, 
a, a decreased inability of this happening, all right? So we can practice convergence skills to help keep that convergence maximized. Convergence is very important for things like reading and working on the computer because you're at a close distance and your eyes exactly, <laughs> yes, I see someone already doing some convergence work there, exactly. So when you're at reading and you're at the computer, you have to converge your eyes. If the eyes do not converge well, then you will start to have double vision. All right. So those are the three main super, super basic things as Parkinson's patients that apply to you. So I really wanted to make this a very, very interactive and experiential uh, meeting. And one of the things uh, we've already done is the deep blink. The next one that I would like for you to all practice is something that is so powerful, not because it's just about your eyes, but it's about interacting with other humans, which to me is so key in keeping your brain healthy. Okay, so we're going to do this exercise and you want to be in a place where you can look out into something really pretty, something that interests you. If you have a window, you can position yourself so that you're looking out the window. This exercise is so nice to do with someone else, with a friend, a loved one, anyone, okay? So if you can, I'd like for you to not look at me <laughs> and see if you can position yourself to look outward into something interesting, something that provides you with some satisfaction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I really want you. And now I want you to center yourself so that you're comfortable. This is very key. All right, right, good. Beautiful, excellent, I'm seeing some great positioning, excellent. The first thing we're going to do, and I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna move this over so you don't have to look at me if you are looking at the screen. I'm gonna give you a view of what we have here at the office towards the north here. View. All right. Okay, beautiful. All right, so I'm going to give you this lovely view here of the outdoors. We're going to think about our posture and try and sit as nice and upright as you can. Your chin is slightly pulled back to give your neck a gentle lengthening. And your shoulders and arms are dropped heavily downwards. So I'm gonna pop in here. So I want you to really drop your arms. Okay, yeah. Now we're gonna focus on the breathing. And this is the best part. We forget to breathe because we're so focused on our screens. Inhale, and you want to think of breathing into your mid back, into the rib cage. Expand into the mid back without lifting your shoulders. And then big exhale. While you feel your ribs pull in, your stomach pull in, and your shoulders dropping. Again, I'm seeing some beautiful work here. Inhale, breathe into the mid back. <sighs> Expanding in the mid back, making your diaphragm strong so it supports your back. Exhale. <sighs> the ribs pull in, the stomach pulls in. The shoulders drop. 
One more time. Inhale, breathe into the back. Shoulders stay easy. Super long exhale. Abdominals are in. Diaphragm supporting the spine. Ribs are in. Shoulders down. Now we're going to talk about what we see. As you're breathing, you're trying to get a really wide angle panoramic view of what you see in front of you. And this is one of the reasons why I try to avoid encouraging people only using the apps for their brain work. They're good supplements, but they're not no substitute for a landscape and outdoor vision. Inhale. You're looking way out into the distance. And if you're with someone, describe what do you see in the distance? What is out there? <sighs> Tell each other exactly what you see. You see some trees maybe. You see a blue sky. You see the rooftops some greens, some beige. Today in LA, where, they, where we have no clouds, it's a cloudless sky. And so you look at these things and observe them with very soft eyes, very gentle focus, so that you can take in the entire view, the whole vista. Great. And then now we're gonna try and bring the focus in a little closer. What are some things you see that are closer to you? Maybe window details, people, cars moving. What are some details that you can see that are a little closer in the background of the horizon? So this is a very great, great exercise to do with a person that you are spending some time with. It helps to calm the whole system down and it helps you develop peripheral awareness while you're also being aware of the little details at the same time. So there's a lot of visual processing going on and you want to just stay as relaxed as you can, and you can do it forever, however long you like. All right, so that's one thing that I often start with, with the clients and patients in vision therapy. I'm gonna move back here. Excellent. All right. Now, um, I think we have a lot of questions. So I'm wondering if we want to do that now, or do we have a few more minutes, Joe? What, what's the best thing here? All right, let me unmute myself. Um, thank you, Dr. Chang. I, I thought that was very educational. I hope everyone in attendance today also enjoyed that. And just as a reminder, you will receive a link with all of Dr. Chang's exercises and helpful hints shortly after the presentation in the coming days. Um, Sarah, how, it looks like we're doing okay on time for questions. Okay, um, just let me remind everyone to please stay muted if you are not asking a question. For those of you who are not able to send their questions via the chat box, we will be taking verbal questions at the end of the written questions. And as a friendly reminder to be sensitive to everyone's time, please make sure your questions are on topic. Um, if not, we will do our best to get to them as time allows. So I will now begin with the questions in the chat box. Um, the first question for Dr. Chang, is there any relationship between PD and starburst glare from headlights? Uh, there could be, there could be. 
if you are developing a light sensitivity, glare sensitivity, that could cause starbursting around headlights at night. Um, the other thing that can also cause starbursting around headlights is the development of cataracts in the eyes. So it could be a combination of the two. Uh, if you are developing light sensitivity, there are tints and lens coatings uh, that can be helpful to reduce that, that starbursting effect. Thank you, doctor. Next question. Um, one of our community members has had prism glasses for approximately a week. They seem to be working on that individual's double vision. Is that all they need to know or there will there be more to do as that individual's Parkinson advances related to their vision? The prism glasses are really nice for helping with double vision. I am a person who always believes though that that's just one aspect of taking care of the, the neural vision. Uh, my interest again, I always go back to is what's going on in the brain. And we want to stimulate all those neurological pathways as much as we can to keep them as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Uh, so I would highly encourage anyone uh, that is already experiencing double vision, that means there's something in the pathways that is causing inefficiency in the eye muscles. So we want to do some vision exercises to help strengthen the neurological pathways that control the eye muscles. And maybe Dr. Joseph might like to add something to this. Um, I'd like to echo it, yes. Um, with the patients that I've seen who um, do benefit from PRISM, uh, sometimes it's stable. Sometimes they're able to wear that same pair for years at a time. And depending on the, um, the severity or the fluctuation in symptoms, sometimes that PRISM isn't enough. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and that's with the diplopia. Sometimes we also do it for helping peripheral awareness as well. So unfortunately, it might not always be enough. Um, I'm going to skip a question ahead as the topics are similar. Sure. Then we'll come back to the middle one. But the next question is, what's the next step if prisms don't work for double vision? Are there visual exercises to do to treat double vision? And where can we find the evidence for those protocols, please? Great. Good, good, good question. Okay, so it depends on what is causing the diplopia. Which muscles are affected? There are a myriad of muscles on the eyeball that all have to work in synchronicity to provide accurate eye movements and coordinated eyes. So that's part of the, the question, I think, is, is knowing, you know, how do we get the eyes to work together? Uh, there are a lot of eye exercises out there, thousands of eye exercises. And it's hard to say there's just one exercise for everyone that will be right. You really have to know which particular muscles need working. And not only that, but where in the brain the problem is. Is it in the frontal cortex? Is it in the deeper brain system, the midbrain? You know, is it in the parietal temporal? And those are things that we study as neurooptometrists. If the problem is going on in the frontal area, then that's more of an issue of um, executive function and control. If it's deeper in the brain and it's in the feedbacks and we've got to integrate all the systems, visual, sound, um, and touch, vestibular. So that's why with Parkinson's disease, it's so important that you do not just one exercise for your eyes, but the eye exercise includes sound, balance, rhythm, because all those feedback loops in the brain go through that precious little basal ganglia to get everything starting to work together, all right? We can do one eye exercise now, which is very helpful, and that's a basic saccade, all right? This is one eye uh, fixation to the other eye fixation. All right, this is a simple exercise that you can practice at home. 
If you have a partner, you can face your partner and your partner can hold up two targets in front of you. And you can practice looking from one target to the other. And the key for this exercise is control, all right? This is more of a frontal feedback loop. Okay, we call it the frontal eye fields. Okay, so this is one exercise if you're having an issue there. So you can take two targets, you can hold them apart or put them on a wall, two stickers, and you're gonna look from one target to the next with control. This one's about control. So what we do here in our vision therapy office, we do tons and tons of this. You probably are all very familiar with this because this is becoming very common to use with Parkinson's patients. It's the metronome. Are you all using this now? So you want to get this app on your phone and the sound integration really will help with the control of your body movements and your eye movements. Okay, so you're going to look from one target to the next with your eyes. And if you have your partner, you can do that. Or maybe I'll just hold up two targets and you can do it here in the screen. any target you know you can have a flashlight or you can have a stick you can use spoons so this is my stick and this is my flashlight my pen light okay so let's practice this together and I'll tell you which one to look at and you're going to try and keep it on rhythm red light red light red light keep your head still Red, light, keep breathing. Look at the target, look at the target, look at the target, fixate the target. Good. We can make it slower. Let's see if it's easier or harder. And we can go like this. Red, light, red, light, red, light. Red, light, red, light, red, light. So you see how you can really start to develop more accurate and controlled eye movements doing this one simple exercise. But there's, there's so many out there. And I, I don't want to tell you, you know, which one is, is the best unless we know really what's the underlying cause of the issue. As far as evidence is concerned, does Dr. Joseph have any comments as far as evidence on eye exercises? So depending on the diagnosis of the patient, there are um, peer reviewed studies that are gonna be available. So convergence insufficiency was one of the diagnoses that might um, follow along with someone with Parkinson's with the inability to control their eye movements in as well. So depending on the diagnosis, there's gonna be greater studies. But if you're looking at um, a comprehensive study with thousands of patients, um, looking at the effectiveness of um, vision therapy with very specifically neuromuscular disorders or Parkinson's or what have you, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to have that kind of literature, unfortunately. So we like to rely on the neurology and the way your brain is mapped and the way neurology works. Um, so yeah, as far as literature though, I did add a link to the chat, um, linking Dr. Padula's, um, website and his information because they actually do expand on it a little bit more. Um, if you are interested more on actual protocols and, um, references, then you can reach out to myself or Dr. Chang afterwards and send us an email and we can put together something we can send to you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, we had a question from one of our community members. Can you please compare Parkinson's and myasthenia gravis symptoms? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Not a golfer. As far as I know and have experienced, um, myasthenia gravis 
really is related to fatigue, where the connections, the connectivity to the muscles fatigue very, very quickly. So there is a test that we do where you keep your eyes fixated up high and a person with myasthenia gravis, the eyes will start to close very quickly because the signals to the eyelids start to weaken. So as far as I'm aware of, the main concern for my senior gravis is there is an issue of fatigue. Parkinson's disease, again, really relates to the dopamine um, issues in that basal ganglia. And, and that is disrupting the feedback loops that occur that control movement. How about you, Dr. Sean? Any insights into that question? Um, not as much. I mean, with some of the, the symptoms may overlap. Um, I think I put in the chat as far as uh, double vision, as far as having problems fixating, like Dr. Chang just said, having problems pursuing. They're going to overlap a lot because it's the neuromuscular dysfunction that both types of patients are experiencing. So even though the etiology of why you're having these symptoms and these issues are different, they'll manifest very similarly. So it actually allows us to treat neuromuscular disorders in a similar fashion across the board. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you both doctors. Uh, we have another question from one of our members. Is dry eye and loss of depth perception, are they early signs of Parkinson's? Uh, I would say the symptoms of dry eye uh, are very common across the board. Again, kind of like what Dr. Sean Joseph mentioned. Uh, I can't say that it is an early sign of Parkinson's disease. Um, as far as I know, uh, it, is, it is something that develops a lot because again, the bleak rate starts to decrease and the tear film becomes less stable because of that. And the meibomian glands start to become less efficient too. As far as the depth perception goes, that actually may be an early sign because if the eye muscles are affected, then not converging well, that will affect depth perception. So it, it may very well be an early sign. What do you think, Dr. Joseph? I think the depth perception is probably, if it's gonna be a symptom, it probably happens sooner um, in that the inability to coordinate where your eyes are pointed into being together is going to impact where you perceive visual space to be. Um, now, if someone is also having um, parietal lobe issues, then that could also be a, um, a manifestation of that. So I would say probably diplopia, or sorry, um, poor depth perception before dry eyes. Thank you both doctors. Um, we had a question from a member who asked if there are considerations peculiar, peculiar to Parkinson's patients getting exams to determine value of surgery for cataracts. And I apologize if I'm not asking that correctly. Um, as far as I know, I'm not really aware of limitations to doing cataract surgery due to having Parkinson's disease. Um, I think that if the doctors find that cataracts are definitely present and it's interfering with your vision, then surgery is highly recommended in, in a Parkinson's patient, just mainly because your mobility is compromised already and depth perception and spatial awareness are compromised already. So having a cataract surgery is probably going to be even more important because you want to be able to have good contrast vision, uh, ability to see things around you clearly. So when you're in a room, you can navigate safely. 
or if you're walking on this sidewalk, you can see those little cracks and, and little bumps in the, in the sidewalk easily. Any thoughts, Dr. Joseph? I would say that it shouldn't be a contraindication. Um, we'd be more concerned if you have problems with diabetes or high blood pressure, some type of vascular disorder, um, or if you just um, don't heal as quickly. Um, it's typically those who have probably more co comorbidities who are gonna be more at risk for developing um, issues or have problems than someone with just simply ocular motor dysfunction or um, Parkinson's. So it shouldn't be a contraindication. Thank you both doctors. Um, this will be our last written question and then we'll go to verbal. Are floaters in the eye part of Parkinson's and what can be done about them? Floaters are a very benign condition that everyone gets. And what happens is the vitreous or the gel inside of the eye detaches from the back of the eye, the retina, and releases some debris into the eye. And it often will look a little like a cobweb or a bug in front of your vision. And it happens spontaneously, um, irregardless of, of um, your situation, your, your comorbidities. And it might be irritating initially and gradually over time, hopefully your brain gets accustomed and habituates to it and learns to ignore it so that you only notice it sometimes, such as when you're looking at a blank background like the sky or something white. Okay, thank you both again. And nothing, um, there's really not much, unfortunately, that you can do. There are some specialists who do some uh, laser treatments to break up the vitreous detachment, but it's kind of, one of those areas that it's a little risky. There are only a few people who are really, really good at it. And you want to make sure if you want to get that done, you go to those people who do it really well. Okay, sorry. Thank you. No, that was a very thorough answer. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to open the panel to verbal questions. Um, please unmute yourself and do your best to remain on topic. And both doctors will provide answers to the best of their ability. So does anybody want to start? Susan, I can see your hand. Why don't you go first? Thank you. Um, my husband has had Parkinson's for quite a few years and he is in bed or he's in a wheelchair um, at a nursing home. Now, just recently, I guess about a month ago, all of a sudden he realized that he couldn't see out of one eye and it just came you know, with no warning at all. And I was just wondering, um, is this something that normally happens? He has glaucoma. They give him drops all the time, and he's had that for a long time. But what does that mean in reference to his other eye? Because that's really scary. Uh, yes, I would highly recommend. Uh, I know it's difficult with COVID. He really needs to have an ophthalmologist go in dilate that eye and take a look inside. Make sure nothing is going on with the retina or the nerve. That's the first thing. If nothing is happening there, then you may need to consult with the neurologist and decide or not if you want some kind of scan done to make sure there's nothing happening posteriorly to the orbit. Yeah, he already has seen an ophthalmologist and the ophthalmologist, because my husband said, all I see is brown out of that eye. And the ophthalmologist said, well, that's because you can't see anymore. So yeah. I guess what you're saying is that he should see a neurologist. Maybe, maybe a neurologist, uh, Dr. Joseph, did you have something that you, you were thinking of? He, maybe a second opinion with another ophthalmologist, um, because to say that you can't see anymore, I mean, Usually when we're looking inside, we can say, okay, this tissue is changed or this is damaged. So there's an actual reason that you're not seeing so well. So if mm -hmm. that's not something that you got or you received, um, I would encourage you to let someone else take a look and say that you would like to understand 
what isn't working correctly that would lead to these changes. Yeah, blindness. Right. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate what you're doing. Welcome. Thank you both. Susan, thank you for the question. Any, um, uh, yes, uh, Francis, if you could unmute yourself. Unmute go for yourself. It. Go yes, for it. Uh, you mentioned a peer view study. Is that something that's happening and we can join or did um, I hear you say that? The studies I was alluding to was in regards to convergence insufficiency. Um, now, if there are studies that are specifically working with patients uh, who have neuromuscular dysfunction and are doing neuro-optometric rehabilitation, that I'm not aware of, but that's something that we can look into. Um, so yes. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? About, oh, I passed somebody. Gail, yeah. our own board member, please take the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see you. Um, I, I have very poor visual spatial um, ability. I had to give up driving because of it. And um, it even affects my being able, I'm an artist and I've, it's affected my ability to, to see something like a building and accurately draw it. You know, I know what I see, but I can't put it on paper. Um, it, it, are there thera visual therapies that would help that? I think we could really try and enhance your ability to control your eyes, to fixate a little bit better on what you're trying to draw. It may not give you the length of time of fixation that you uh, were used to previous, but maybe just add on a little bit more time so you can actually fixate what you're looking at and give yourself some time to start drawing it. Does that make sense? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know something that used to take maybe five minutes to draw now can take me, I mean, I try over and over and over again to get it accurate and it, it you know, it, sometimes it takes 15, 20 minutes just to, to be able to accurately draw something that I'm looking at. There are visual motor integration exercises that are very good to do. And you can start large and work your way down to details. And we work with uh, patients who have problems with visual motor integration, copying forms, um, aligning forms and columns, things like that. And I'm thinking that might be an area that would be very helpful for you. What do you think, Dr. Joseph? I agree. Um, one of the, the concepts that we play on when we're um, performing therapy with patients is where you're directing your attention. So for some patients, it, it may be the ocular motor component component in that you need to scan or you need to actually take those extra moments to attend to details of what you're taking in. The second part might just be that the parts of your brain that have to hold that information and to keep that picture here, your ability to hold that information might not be as high of a quality as it once was for whatever reason. Um, so nutritionally, Dr. Chang was mentioning the omega-3 fatty acids are a good way to help support the tissue. Um, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine, vitamin B or B complex, these are all things that are going to support the tissue. But when it comes to therapies, yes, there's ways to help enhance those skills. However, it, it is patient dependent. So I want to promise you that's something that would absolutely change. Um, part of it does depend on how efficiently and how quickly a patient is able to learn new tasks and incorporate new information and then be able to hold it. Sometimes we'll teach patients skills and they can do it wonderfully while they're in therapy with us. But when they come back in a week, there's some regression. Mm -hmm. So it, it is patient dependent. Um, we're going to wrap up now to be sensitive to Dr. Chang's time. Thank you both for the responses, Dr. Chang and Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much. Excellent work, everyone.
um, as a reminder to all, you will be receiving a link to view this recording um, shortly after in the next coming days. Thank you again for joining us today at our Let's Talk Parkinson's event. Our next event next year will be on Thursday, January 21st, where we talk about cannabis and Parkinson's. You'll receive an email with a link to register. It'll be led by Alan, Dr. Alan Frankel. Let's Talk Parkinson's is made possible by Abbott, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, U.S. World Meds, Medtronic, a grant from Linda and Stuart Resnick, and by our whole community, including those of you joining us today. Please don't forget, if you're able to, to make a donation. You can find the link at pcla.org. Org. By donating, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of the members of our community who are living with Parkinson's disease, their care partners, and families. PCLA is a nonprofit, and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed Let's Talk Parkinson's, please consider donating and help us continuing our work. As always, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Our email is info at pcla.org, or you can give us a call at area code 310. 880-3143. Thank you, everybody. Please stay safe and stay well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.